So obviously today is all about giving you a quick update on T75. The, the goal is on the banner outside. It's really about trying to get as much of the world's seafood production, both farmed and wild, started, started on the journey to sustainability. The US and other countries have odd traditions of strange races, like typically putting tortoises on the ground and watching them betting money on which tortoise will get to the end of a small field first. We're trying to get all these fisheries and aquaculture regions started on that race, get them across the starting line. That is what T75 is about. By the end of the target, which is 20 months from now, there will still be a lot of FIPS and aquaculture regions still moving down the race course. They are not, we're not trying to get them to the finishing line. We are not uh, naive about the challenges in some of these fisheries and, and aquaculture reason, regions, but it's about getting them started formally on that improvement path. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Um, so the focus for us in the next 20 months or so is really on getting as many of these projects up and running as possible. The, what we have done is really laid out maps. We'll get to that in a minute. Before I get into too much detail, I'm reminded of the fact that we actually do have some new faces in the crowd, some companies that haven't heard about T75 previously or don't know much about fisheries improvement projects. Um, and I thought it would be, you know, while I, while I thoroughly enjoy seeing looks of confusion amongst the audiences I'm talking to, I thought maybe I should step back and try and give a bit of context first. Um, there's going to be a lot of numbers and statistics later, so I'm going to try and start with a few stories. The origins of SFP, the thinking behind SFP, dates back to the early to mid-1990s. Um, I was hired uh, to help represent a non-profit, an NGO, an environmental charity, at a ministerial level meeting in Europe that had the objective of introducing a marine protected area network into European waters. The science was excellent. The NGOs were all aligned. The case for protection was compelling. It was well made. And we failed spectacularly. Absolute got my head handed to me. We lost it. Won nothing. And we failed because the NGOs had positioned the argument, they tried to shut down important fishing areas as part of their protection measures and made it an us versus them battle with the fishing industry. And what happened in that room was crystal clear to anyone paying attention. The industry was well organized. They sat close to the ministers and whispered in the ministers' ears about the implications for jobs and even more importantly, the implications for votes in some of the marginal voting areas. And unsurprisingly, the ministers went with the industry opinion that these new marine protected areas were not needed. So, you know, I like to think of myself as an observer and pay attention and learn and <clears throat> hopefully not repeat the same mistakes again. My, my first lesson learned was the fishing industry has political power. I think everyone would recognize that. So some NGOs turned it into a discussion of how do we beat them? That was not my approach. My approach was they have power. How can we work with them to get alignment and work together to get some common objectives done? Because there was support among those fishermen for certain protected area measures. There was not uniform opposition, but it was the way in which it had been put together and presented had created a lot of that sense of conflict from the start. Around the same time, I was helping the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization do their annual review of the status of marine fisheries. Uh, and it's a worldwide review, and I, get, I got to meet some of the world's best fisheries experts, region after region after region. And as we added up all the evidence, uh, these reports came out in 1995 and 1997, I believe, <clears throat> what we saw in region after region, fishery after fishery, were ministers ignoring science and setting quotas too high, in part because of requests from the fishing industry. Now this was interesting to me because even earlier we had examples where the fishing industry had got organized and put in place strong fisheries management because they knew they would make a lot more money 
if they could figure out how to manage the fishery properly and prevent collapse. So famous examples like Iceland, New Zealand, and Alaska. But that didn't happen in the majority of the world's fisheries. So the key lesson for me was, huh, enormous financial incentives exist already for these fishermen to get organized and take control of their fishery, and for some reason, it ain't enough. So it's not obvious to me that adding more financial incentive is going to tip the balance. There's something else going on. In 1998, I had the great pleasure of working in one of the world's most pristine coral reefs that was being, unfortunately, heavily damaged by IUU fishing. The largest legally registered seafood exporter was heavily complicit in buying the IUU fish and exporting it out of the country which I thought was a bit unusual because he was otherwise an upstanding member of the local community. Excuse me. So I went to have a chat with the CEO. And I'm going to, this isn't exactly what he said. He was a little bit more polite, but it was sort of along the following lines. And we had the meeting on, in his office, which was in the dock that he owned, above the boat fitting uh, operations that he owned, next to the three or four longliners that he owned. So the point he said was, look around you. All my money is invested in, this, in these boats, in this dock, in this processing facility. All my children work here. Now I know that this IUU is out of control and, and going to collapse the fishery. But do you think I'm an idiot and jeopardizing the future of my company and my children out of choice? The problem is there are so many unregistered companies that are buying this fish, no questions asked. If I don't buy it, they will. So if you're coming here to ask me not to buy it, what you're really doing is saying, we want you to go out of business, the legally registered company, and transfer your business to the completely illegal companies. And he literally then said, now, are you an idiot? Sometimes I am, but in that particular case, I said, mm, no, 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 no. So what we did is we sat down and brainstormed about it, and we agreed that we all had a, a, an interest in improving compliance in the fishery. And to get there, we had to work together with the government to get the unregistered fishing companies registered or thrown out. And part of the commitment that he made was, if we do this, I will lead the efforts to ensure that only legal fishing happens, and only the legal fish goes through my company. So he was willing to lead that coalition. Um, so for me, the lesson learned was the, the fishers understood the risks, at least some of them understood the risks they were running, and some of them wanted to do something about it. And if you could find a smart way forward, they'd be willing not only to support it, but also lead those efforts. Sadly, uh, we failed. Again, there's a theme here. We failed because the government in that case, in a, it was in a developing country with very little resources, couldn't figure out how to get rid of the illegal operators. They were already illegal, but they had impunity in a very remote area just wandering about uh, buying. And there wasn't enough capacity to shut them down. And the market was buying all the fish, no questions asked. So there's only one more story to go, and then we'll get back to facts and figures and numbers and graphs. So I'm, I'm sitting there putting this together. They've got political power. They'd like to do the right thing, but it's hard to get them all aligned because of the way the market's set up, the way they're set up. In 2002, I was asked by McDonald's to give an overview of the world's cod, haddock, hake, pollock, and related so-called whitefish fisheries. Uh, a little bit of food history here. In the mid-'80s, as late as 1987, all of the filet of fish served in every McDonald's restaurant worldwide was North Atlantic cod which as a Scotsman who thought thoroughly enjoys North Atlantic cod, I can tell you it is by far the best fish to put in a filet of fish. Sadly, uh, those cod fisheries collapsed in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and they, McDonald's, along with Unilever and virtually every other company that relied on breaded whitefish products, fish fingers, filet of fish patties, they had to switch to other species, like Pollock. And then through the 1990s, one after another of these other fisheries also got overfished, also ran into problems, also got depleted. And 
by 2002, there were very few sustainable, well-run whitefish fisheries out there for major buyers to base their future business on. That's not a good place for anyone to be. Does anyone know, remember when, uh, when bird flu broke out in, uh, I can remember it was sometime in the late 90s, early 2000s, the chicken was slaughtered across Asia and no one could get chicken in a restaurant in Asia except McDonald's. How was this possible? McDonald's chartered every single available 747 cargo plane in the world and moved chicken into Asia so that it was on their menu. They made a loss on that, but they also got a lot of reputational gain in Asia for maintaining their menu throughout the program. They have a fanatical focus on assured supply and keeping it going. So for them, the fish story was, and, and the guy who ran that had also run beef procurement in Britain during the BSE outbreak that disrupted their supplies. So they had a lot of experience, a lot of concern over disruption to supply. So McDonald's charged the leaders of a couple of their suppliers to sit down with me and others to try and work out uh, a solution. And that's when we sort of put all the pieces together uh, in the first, what we called fisheries improvement partnership at the time. And the key point about a fisheries improvement partnership is it involves every part of the supply chain. Uh, there's a new term out, not new, it's 10 years old at this point, fisheries improvement project, which also reflects on grassroots efforts and things like that. So there's a broad scope. But what we were focused on was pieces that involved every part of the supply chain. And our role, we help major buyers like McDonald's ask for action. And our expectation of them, of our partners, is that they will then ask their suppliers to align and then ask highly influential fishing companies, processors, and exporters to work together to engage governments and deliver conservation solutions. So I just want to stop there for a moment because now I hope all the stories make sense. So I observed that local companies, local fishing companies and processors have a lot of political power, but they need to be aligned. I observed that they find it very hard to get aligned because of problems like illegal competition, uh, structure in the industry, really weird government policies that fostered a race for fish, a bunch of problems. So how do you help them get aligned? Well, you can do it by bringing them together with the market. And we figured out that if you got enough of the middle of the supply chain engaged, and we did this early on, I want folks to re recall that we were doing this in 2002 and three. There were one or two major buyer commitments and sustainability worldwide at the time. And what we did with their suppliers is we went sideways and said to their suppliers, you need to come to the table, even though you don't have a customer asking about sustainability yet, it's in your interest to come to the table and participate and try and drive improvements in these fisheries. Um, what we learned was that if you can get enough suppliers that are in the middle of the supply chain, if you can get them together, we can build enough leverage and momentum to get key actors in the local fisheries to come together and start talking to government and start building a consensus. You don't need everybody. There will always be leakage. There are always people who don't buy in. They're going to come to the table last. I couldn't care less. I know that's an obstacle for some of you to get started. My message to you is eat it up. Yeah, so life's unfair. You're going to go out there and do your good work and others will benefit on your back. And yeah, that's, it. that's the way it goes. But you're going to benefit as well. And hopefully at some point, you'll get a competitive edge out of it. So the first FIPS were a bit slow to build because of the approach. Um, but you know, we obviously saw a big bump up when Walmart made their commitment publicly in 2006. Uh, and then a lot of other NGOs, a lot of other retailers, a lot of other suppliers got involved. And it was amazingly quick how fast the US industry in general came on board. Uh, there were those of us sitting there. I wrote a business plan in 2009 that projected that we would take five years, five years to get the US industry on board. And literally got it approved by the board at the beginning of 2010. And by the end of 2010, every single retailer in the US bar, I think one, had made a public commitment. So I threw that business plan away and started writing another one, which is really boring. But it's nice when it's for good reasons. Um, the industry leadership model in these FIPS is something I want to stress, um, again, based on observation. If you, as a importer, a US importer, go to another country and try and tell a fisheries minister directly how they should run their fishery, what do you think would be the outcome of that meeting? 
Well, it depends how polite the country is, but it's going to be a very polite, there's the door, uh, do you want me to get you the taxi to the airport? Kind of response. It's got to come from your suppliers who have the local political capital. Um, NGOs are already at that table. It's important there's alignment, but it's important that the industry comes to that table too. CEOs, when they talk about conservation, do it in a different way. They do it with authority based on the export earnings implications, the implications for jobs, and what it means for votes for those politicians. And in most other countries, they're also willing to do campaign financing and make it clear that the political support is based on getting the fisheries management right. So these are, this is the inside baseball that's absolutely needed to fix fisheries. Again, the story about fishery after fishery asking for more quota, even though they knew they were on a one-way road to hell. Why were they doing that? There's clever people. They need to switch that to a different path. So by uh, this is the whitefish story. Uh, I, I'm going to just put it up for a split second. Um, we report numbers of FIPS this, numbers of FIPS that, and everyone else who's not really looking at the detail, their eyes glaze over and they're like, well, you know, how do I know that's really doing anything? And that's a good question because, frankly, you know, you've got to look at the outcome and the results and measure. The graph at the bottom right, so the graph at the, bottom, the top left says, oh, look, we went from four stocks certified to 27. So big whoop. Great. Were they all good condition for, to start with? No, I made that point. A lot of them were heavily depleted. The key graph's the bottom right. This is total biomass of adult whitefish alive in the world. It's a little bit out of date. We haven't bothered, frankly, updating it because the story was pretty good a few years ago and it's continued to get better. Uh, essentially, we almost doubled, we, the whitefish industry that led these efforts, almost doubled the amount of adult whitefish swimming around in the world's oceans in the space of about a decade. So there was rebuilding of Barents Sea cod, Russian pollock, squeeze on IUU, was different stocks coming back in South America, uh, et cetera. It goes on. So when people ask, well, how do you know this works? How do you know the FIPS are working? We're tracking that. We're looking at it in terms of biomass, bycatch reduction, endangered species getting better off, MPAs. That is happening, uh, even though we then tend to just report percentage FIP, which uh, is, is a little bit harder to get. So by 2015, we felt there was a lot of momentum. We saw in new industry partners emerging in many parts of the world. There wasn't just a whitefish story. In fact, it had ceased to be just a whitefish story in 2008-9. Um, but the whitefish story gave an example of what could happen if enough of the industry came together and agreed on a common set of priorities to go chase. They could change the world. They could change the world. That's what they did. So we thought, well, you know, let's see if we can get the rest of the industry excited about this. Maybe there are other seafood sectors, other types of seafood, where a little bit of organization and a little bit of a push, we can emulate what happened in whitefish. And that's where we come back to Target 75. We looked at every sector out there and we said, where is there industry leverage that either exists or we think can be built that can lead to the same sort of story of lots of fisheries and aquaculture improvement projects? And we have examples from fish meal, from squid, from tuna, from snapper grouper, from octopus. Uh, the, the entire US industry got organized on blue swimming crab and famously runs it themselves through, through the National Fisheries Institute Crab Council. Um, and we looked at all of that and said, you know what, let's be big and bold. We've got to communicate this. This is an issue for the seafood industry writ large. There's always bad news stories out there. Always will be. You are never going to solve all the bad actors. There's always going to be bad stories out there. But you can put a big dent in it, and you can show an overwhelmingly good story at a global scale and change the narrative. But you have to put a clear target out there. You have to align the industry uh, and behind some common strategic targets. And, and that's what we did with T75. So what is in T75? We have 60 million tons of world production. There are obviously a lot of production that's not there, and I'll get to that in a minute. But we focused on the, w the sectors where we felt there was credible evidence of either existing leverage or leverage that could be built. So that's where these sectors came from. We went through the whole lot, and we said, 
we'll see on the next slide, there's like 30 million tons of Chinese carp out there now, but it gets eaten in China, and it's a key fishery, and it's a key farming operation. Can we influence it? No. So that's a shame, the big volume, but you know, it's, that's the reality. So we said we can, however, get after farm shrimp. The United States and Europe, particularly the United States, is a massive market for farm shrimp. Farm salmon, huge market in, Asia, in, uh, in, in, in Europe and, and in North America. Tilapia, interesting. We thought, oh, when we started this work, I just want to put this in perspective. When I started working with McDonald's in early 2000s, there was one point something million tons of tilapia production. And it's been growing dramatically ever since, and it's adding about a million tons a year. And we're like, Phew, hard to keep track of it all now, and all the pangasius that appeared in Vietnam in the space of three or four years. So we nonetheless put tilapia and pangasius up there because there is quite a lot of market leverage out of uh, Europe and uh, for pangasius and, tila and US for tilapia. And there's also 45 million tons of wild caught fish. Um, fish meal fisheries, will, we, we've split between those in South America and the North Atlantic, which we call sort of classic, like Coke classic. They're the classic small pelagic fisheries, the anchovetas, big schools of fish that are caught very efficiently in large purse seining operations. And then there's the Asian fish meal operations, which tend to have a large portion made up of, uh, uh, of, of product caught by, by trawls, uh, very indiscriminate trawling uh, across uh, Southeast and, and Northwest uh, Atlantic, uh, Pacific, sorry. So within fish meal, um, you know, we saw that uh, the industry was well organized, particularly in South America and the North Atlantic. Um, a lot of leverage through the aquaculture industry, particularly through salmon and shrimp. Uh, whitefish, we've already discussed. Uh, tuna, tuna split. Canned tuna, the US and Europe has huge leverage. Huge. God, I sound like someone else at the moment. I won't use that word again. <laughs> huge. Um, and then you get to fresh frozen tuna. Very different story. Very hard. Requires a lot of support out of Japan, or it simply isn't going to happen. Uh, there will be a tuna long line, global long line SR meeting coming where we'll talk about some of that work. Tom's lurking outside because he knew I was going to point at him. He's waving at you now. Um, so different things happening there. Squid. Um, I'll get to squid in a minute. Let me just jump over that. Um, crab, lots of different types of crab out there. We split it into the cold water crab, the blue, the blue swimming crabs, and what we called other warm water, which was stuff we rapidly realized actually really shouldn't be part of T75 because there's not a lot of mud crab and coconut crab and other crab entering markets we can influence. Uh, snapper and grouper, which uh, again, very influential markets in the US and the Southeast, uh, but also growing market interest elsewhere. And then octopus which we very strategically a few years ago said we really need to get after other markets outside of the US and Northern Europe. And we deliberately went after Spain. Um, we have Pedro Ferrer and Carmen, I suspect. Pedro's here, Carmen also here. And we now have a, a lot of uh, engagement from Spain, from the market, uh, directly to suppliers. Um, and a lot of good new progress on, on octopus and obviously also been a big help on squid, which we'll get to in a minute. So. There's a lot of farmed fish that is not part of T75, the, the carps of the world that I've talked about before. There's also a lot of shellfish that's not part of T75. But when you look at the wild caught side, it covers approximately half of global landings. So this is not an insignificant amount. It's a very global ambition uh, in, in terms of scale. What it looks like when you look at all the other information that's out there in terms of sustainability and ratings and evaluation, this is a bit of a, a new slide that we're, we're looking at. But here you can see Seafood Watch, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium's ratings for wild caught. What's MSC certified? You can see the 13% top left is certified. You get into what's rated. Then you get down to the FIPS. And down at the bottom, this, these, this is the target that we're still trying to hit through the remaining work of Target 75. And that gives you the half of wild capture uh, that's at play. So the, I don't know how to put this, but most of the reasonably good fisheries that we know about that are rated, they're already certified. There's a little bit of yellow out there, but then after that, there's not a lot of stuff that we think is going to be an easy way to MSC without a FIP. And you can see we've got, you know, the eight, seven point something percent 
currently in a FIP, and then the large volume we're trying to shift over. So what's not in T75, just to recap that, I don't want any confusion, but I'm trying to be very transparent. Uh, we literally, there is, I couldn't believe the numbers. The first three bullets are Asia. So Asia is heavily in T75, but they just do a lot of seafood, a lot. Um, so it's 50 million tons of Asian farm carp and shellfish that is not part of T75. We have 17 million tons of unidentified fish, stuff that appears in FAO databases as, huh? Which is a little bit worrying from a fisheries management perspective. And then there's another 17 million tons of fish that predominantly is caught for and stays in the Asian market that we have very little leverage on. And then outside of Asia, we have a little bit. We have 6 million tons of non-farmed, uh, non-Asian farmed carp and shellfish. A lot of good shellfish, ob obviously, per being produced around the world. And then there's another 15 million tons of non-Asian wild landings. And that, again, a lot of shellfish, flatfish. But the big volume items are actually small pelagic fisheries that have switched to human consumption. Uh, and are none, well, the reason they're not in there is T75 is they're already MSC certified for the most part, the uh, North Atlantic herrings of the world and things like that. So this is the numbers we reported in 2018 for T75. Um, I'm not going to get into all the detail, but it is, again, the, the certified is the blue, uh, in a FIP, and on track is the green. Stuff we were trying to reach through the SRs and had a target named, and we had suppliers discussing how to get a project going. That's the speckle. And the sort of candy red stripe was the, oh, what are we going to do here piece. So that was last year, this time last year. Uh, now we've added a little bit, not a huge amount. This is not, let's not flick a switch and let's get 20 new industry organizations going and new projects. It takes time. But we have seen an uptick in the amount of certified seafood, sustainable. Uh, we have seen an uptick on the numbers in FIPS, um, which is great. And I'll get to some of those specific volume numbers shortly. We've seen a very large increase in the number of agreed target fisheries and aquaculture regions that we're talking about within supply chain roundtables, which we expect some of that to pop, meaning go into a FIP quite soon, tortoise across the start of the race. But we still have 15%, uh, the darker red candy striping that we're actively trying to reach. So within each sector, we're trying to hit 75% of that sector. So. There's 25% there's of each sector that we're not going to try and hit, and that's the top left. What has changed, a little bit more detail, um, 14 uh, new FIPS, or ones that had gone uh, dormant. Or we have a whole bunch of expressions for FIPS that do weird things. Well, there's boomerang FIPS, which you think have gone and come back. There's dengue FIPS that were going fine and then suddenly just keeled over, and you're like, what the hell happened there? We got a whole, a whole bunch of slang. We'll talk to you about. But uh, well, and if you want to know what your FIP is, let, let come on, you tell me, tell you later. Um, there's some miracle FIPs. How did they get that done? Um, so we've supported. Uh, there's about another 25 pre-FIPs that got started. Pre-FIP discussions uh, in these SRs in 2018. The results are two million tons uh, of production met the target 75 uh, of being in a FIP at least and making progress towards sustainability. And we have another 3 million tons that we added to the known targets that are actively trying to get a FIP going. Um, currently, we have 152 individual companies involved in 17 supply chain roundtables supported by SFP. I'm told that the, some of the meetings, the supply chain roundtable meetings, now have over 60 people attending them. Um, so some it's going to be standing room only in some of those meetings. But we're still looking for more leverage in some sectors. Uh, and that will be discussed within the supply chain roundtables. But if you have friends in Japan who buy a lot of tuna, fresh frozen, sashimi grade, please talk to Tom. We need your help to get those companies to the table. We have a few of them there already. Uh, if you do business in Squid and know who some of the big South Korean importers are into South Korea, please come forward. Talk to Sam, talk to Pedro, talk to Carmen. We need those guys on board, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a list of these things that each of the SRs is working on. I'm going to talk about squid a little bit. I also want to recognize that uh, I, as you've seen from every slide so far, uh, graphics is not my strong point. Um, uh, uh, Perry from O2, uh, neither, actually, where's Sam? He's hiding around here somewhere. 
Yeah, Sam had the numbers, but his strong point is not graphics either. It took Perry from Ocean Outcomes to actually produce a nice graph that told a story without needing a PhD in statistics. Uh, he said, then, in the past, I'll just put a row of zeros. Nothing, nothing was happening in, in, the, in the squid fisheries in terms of documented improvements. I want to be quite clear, a lot of those fisheries are quite well managed, actually. But in terms of documented FIPS and improvement efforts, we had very little going on. And uh, we'll hear more about this, and there are some folks who have been absolutely instrumental in getting some of the big squid fisheries of the world into an FIP. Uh, and we do have progress. Six squid FIPS are now up and running. 28 com companies, a lot of uh, Spanish companies, US companies as well. I believe this to be true. I'm going to look at Jen Camerley, also highlight the fact that she's now reading her emails instead of paying attention. That's great. Jen. What's the number one uh, menu item, appetizer menu item in the United States? Shrimp cocktail, Shrimp cocktail calamari, I believe. Yeah. It's calamari. So US food service, anyone from US food service here? Restaurants, you see that's part of the problem. Uh, and that's why we're still actively trying to get US food service to the table is they have a huge piece to play in some key pieces. Who eats the majority of fresh frozen sashimi grade tuna in the United States? It goes through food service. And they're not here. Oh, someone is? Thank you. So, you know, in the squid world, we, we do have some of those companies active, which is great, but we're trying to get more on board. But uh, again, we really need some of those big companies in South Korea uh, that, uh, that are huge players in the industry. And we have 14% of volume improving, and I would say watch this space. I'm assured that there will be some new announcements that will more than, well, hopefully double that number very shortly. Um, the amount of detail involved in this um, is, is it, I find it hard to keep track of all of it, and I get paid nothing to do nothing but try and keep track of all of it. We have a whole team of people now who are running supply chain roundtables. They're the people to talk to about each sector. If someone comes up to me and says, hey, Jim, what can I do in fresh frozen tuna? I'm like, what part of talk to Tom did you not understand? What can I do in squid? Well, Sam, Pedro, Octopus, Carmen. So there are people leading these SRs. Talk to the supply chain roundtable leads. Uh, read the sector reports. There's a ton of data and information in there. Um, my brain can't keep up with all of it. I'm getting old. I just like to sort of drool in a corner. Anyone wants to buy me a drink, I'll be in the bar later. Um, 2019 priorities. There are, I've already mentioned them. I'm just going to whiz through. There are some supply chain roundtables where we are actively trying to recruit more suppliers. Fresh frozen tuna, Japan. Squid, South Korea. And there are others. Um, we have 16 million tons already in progress. That's a huge number, but we need to get them formally across the starting line. They are not yet in FIPS. That's that speckled part of the pie chart that I put up. That's, that's a ton of fish, 16 million tons. If we can get all of that moving, uh, that, would have, that would have a huge implication. And then we need to, I don't want anyone to forget, it's very hard for anyone to maintain two targets at the same time. But if all we do is launch new projects that then don't achieve very much, Ultimately, that's not a great outcome. And so we, again, for the T75, it's about those FIPS having shown an impact in the water, ideally. Some real substantive change. I'll get to that in a minute. But I used to say to anyone who was launching a FIP, what, what, what's your advice? I'd say, like, you know, that famous movie, show me the money. In that case, I don't mean the money. I mean, show me the results. Show me the policy change. Show me that your FIP has oomph. Show me that you can get to a minister, have a conversation, and get a policy change. Because I can tell you, having sat and led a whole bunch of FIPS myself, it is extremely hard to know what's going on behind closed doors between industry and their ministers. And so even in the FIPS I was leading back in the day when we did that, I wasn't confident it was a good FIP until I saw a policy change come out the far end of the sausage making machine that I had asked for. And it, you are, if you don't deliver that early in the FIP, you're asking for a ton of trust. Well, it's coming. Believe me, it's coming. No, no, not good enough. I'm sorry. Figure out what you can get delivered now that sends a clear message to anyone asking that your FIP has oomph and you're getting results. Get some results. So we are going to focus very heavily on that in, in 2019. 
particularly for those groups, the FIPS, that aren't at that level yet. And finally, if we're going to achieve T75, we cannot persist with individual suppliers working with a few boats and uh, maybe their suppliers on their own, and that's down there in the little gray box down here. These are good projects. Don't get me wrong. They, they're great projects. Many of them have done really interesting stuff with traceability, gear change, improved quality on the boats, better pricing to the fishermen, better responses to some of the communities they're working with. These are very good projects. But if you want to achieve impact at global scale, you need to scale up these individual projects. You, how long would it take to fix Indonesian fisheries, 1,000 fishermen at a time? Well, doing the math in my head, we know there's half a million fishermen. That's a long time. So how do we get to the national scale? So where we've been working historically has been in the fishery zone or the aquaculture zone in the middle. What we started to really focus on is can we translate this into national scale? Uh, anyone who wants to really understand how that works, uh, I believe the NFI Crab Council meeting uh, it's downstairs in the big ballrooms at the far end of the hotel here. It's at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, and they will be talking about the six or seven now national level FIPS that they are running uh, through industry associations and that they are financing through a levy they put, a voluntary levy they put on their imports. It's a very impressive operation. And that's how we have seen so much progress in blue swimming crab. Blue swimming crab is lots of tiny fisheries, all operating through lots of tiny mini plants that get aggregated up through about 16 major processors in Indonesia that come into this country through roughly the same number of importers. So the opportunity for someone here to go, no, I don't buy any of this collaborative stuff, I just want to do my own project with my own fishery and my own mini plant, they could have done it. And we spent 10 years saying, no, don't do it. Everyone's got to work together to raise the bar in Indonesia for all the fishermen, for all the fishery. And that's been very successful. So a lot of what we're doing now is around trying to get existing projects to figure out how to collaborate and go to scale. So you know, it may not be a lot of new FIPS, but it may be FIPS that get a lot bigger, for example. So that's part of the Target 75 initiative. So I am going to kind of bring it back to FIP results, because at the end of the day, I, what I care about is how many fish there are in the water and what impacts are being visited on marine life and habitats as a result and whether the fishermen are getting a fair shake as part of that deal of catching that fish. And that all depends on the outcomes of the individual FIPS, not what happens in a supply chain roundtable. Those supply chain roundtables set the tone, they help align, but at the end of the day, it's the FIPS that need to deliver. Well, the good news is we had 45 FIPS that are publicly reporting on fisheryprogress.org uh, that have FIP, uh, grades of B, A or B. And that means that in the last 12 months, they have reported A outcome that would result in a measurable improvement in an MS, one or more MSC scores. So a lot of those improvements are not very sexy at all. I was hoping for, we saved this species, we saved that species, we got this new protected, uh, well, we got this new logbook system, and we got this new harvest control rule, and we got this new research program. And, but these are the building blocks upon which you ultimately do get stock recovery. You cannot go from zero to a reduction in fishing mortality without passing all vessels need to be registered, a stock assessment is needed, a quota setting policy is there, there has to be good enforcement, yada, yada, yada. There's a lot of stuff you have to get in place to see the end result. So those bits are getting built block by block through a very structured process. Um, we have seen some very exciting uh, results, which I'm hopefully will be able to do more to highlight around endangered species protection. Uh, gear reform. Um, some of this is a little bit old, some of it's still happening. What we don't have yet is the peer-reviewed science that says that the reduction in, for example, turtle impacts from the Gulf of Mexico shrimp fishery has actually resulted in a rebuilding or protection of the turtles. We know that the TED compliance is much better. What we don't know is whether it's had that impact. But hopefully we will very shortly, Megan. How shortly? I want a good news story. <laughs> so we are waiting for some of these results to come out. Well, the, the final thing I want to want to point out here is a ton of the fisheries in T75, tuna, mahi, squid, a lot of it is cross-regional. A lot of it is cross-country. A lot of it re requires RFMO management. And that makes it difficult. Um, we've seen decades of 
attempts in the tuna fisheries to have improved harvest control rules and management, and that has pretty much failed uniformly with some exceptions. What I wanted to highlight was how quickly this approach of getting supply chain aligned and working with the catch sector in different countries can result in effective RFMO reform. And for those of you who want to hear more, I'm going to highlight some of the guys at the front who have been very effective in, in getting what we call Kalamasur. That's Kalamari. Uh, you have to, do you want to explain anything here, Enrique? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's basically an industry uh, association of producers and processors getting together and advocating for policy change through their delegates and their uh, and we have replicated the model for uh, back and running. And we need your support to get more processors from, uh, and, and producers from uh, producing countries to get a strong uh, association there. Regional in the scope to get to advocate for changes that they are involved. So I think. What Klamasur told me was just if you had the leading players from Chile and Peru at the table talking to their delegates about what was needed, you could get a result at the RFMO. We can replicate that in Mahi, if, and it's close, but we need a little bit more help to get some of those delegates to pay attention. Join Core Mahi, which uh, they're very good at coming up with acronyms that sound good. I don't know what that means, but Core Mahi. Um, Aquaculture progress. This has been a hard nut to crack. Um, farm level certification is great. It's needed. You saw some of it. Uh, well, some of it is reported in the certification ratings report that I pulled that uh, circle chart from. But for SFP, what we're trying to do is promote zonal management. Uh, we're trying to think about what aquaculture looks like at a landscape level. Um, the points we've made in the past is if your brilliant certified farm expertly run is next to a cesspool full of disease, it doesn't matter what you're doing on your farm, you're running a big risk. If your farm is downstream of, and your water intake is downstream of a bunch of farms that aren't doing very well, you're at risk. Um, I get bored, frankly, telling people the same thing time and time and time again. And the aquaculture industry is probably the most frustrating group of people I've worked with. Um, 2009, Chile, they just lost $1.6 billion in a, in a salmon disease outbreak. GAA held their meeting, and the world's largest salmon buyer stood up and said, I have a question, but it's not for the Chilean salmon guys. It's for the Vietnamese and Thai shrimp guys in the room. What are you doing to stop this happening in your country? Silence reigned. Silence kept reigning until EMS that came along a few years later and knocked that industry sideways. So then we had the same question asked. And today we see a little bit better response, but, and certainly Chile obviously then did take responses to fix some of these issues in their own salmon production. But we still have huge problems in many other countries. There's a lot of reasons for why it's tough to do this. Um, so we listened very carefully to industry. We tried to figure out a way to get this done. And then we thought, you know, Let's just get started in Indonesia. It features on the, it's important for tilapia, it's important for shrimp, uh, you know, it's important across a whole range of stuff. We have some funding from a foundation to go out and start laying the, the groundwork, if you will, to get zonal management in place. Let's work with a whole bunch of NGOs and industry to agree a common set of best practices for Indonesia. And as we did this, the Indonesian government got interested and we thought, well, this is great. So now we have a distant demand for sustainability from the market. There's nobody from the industry at the table at this point, but the Indonesian government gets it because, you know, for those of you who've been attending our meetings for the last six or seven years, you know every year we do a joint meeting with the Indonesian government here to promote what they've been doing in, in wild FIPS. So uh, in, in the work that's happened, and this will be presented here, uh, 1 p.m., Carlton, I'm forgetting the day, can anyone? Tomorrow, thank you. <laughs> um, there will be a formal announcement that the best practices document has been finalized uh, and that the Indonesian government uh, is going to support it and apply it at a national scale. Uh, and you know, I'm not saying job done, far from it. The tortoise just crossed the starting line. There's a long way to go. But hey, it's progress. Um, please come to the meeting. 
uh, it'll help you understand what's going on, and you can help us get other countries to follow suit. Um, I do want to reflect that there's also a communications opportunity here, much broader than seafood, much broader than T75. This, our initiative lines up very closely with the so-called Sustainable Development Goals, Life Below Water being number 14. It's a shame that more of us weren't more vocal early on. We could have made it number one, obviously biggest part of the world, underwater. Never mind, next time. Um, there's a ton of work happening in this sector. Uh, this T75 lines up with it very well. It will give you a good opportunity to tie to some of the, uh, the work that's happening as part of the UN SDGs. Now, some of that is just purely a comms opportunity. For anyone sourcing out of a developing country, it's a whole different ballgame. If you can tie your work to the SDGs, that opens up what's called a public-private partnership funding op opportunity, and then you're talking millions of dollars on the table to help promote fish the basic fisheries management building blocks that we've just been talking about. So we had a, a session with the Global Environment Facility that have a new funding window open to move money in that direction. Um, I would urge you to look at those opportunities, uh, particularly uh, uh, in the context of sourcing and helping FIPS in, in developing countries. So how else can you help? I mean, as I've made, make a public commitment uh, to, to participate on the supply chain roundtables, to source from FIPS, specifically to source from the suppliers who are really getting the FIPS going. It's great that you buy from a FIP, but it would be even better if you actually direct your business to the companies that have really worked their butt off to get these things started. Um, so really focus on the suppliers that are mobilizing change and, and help, get, help us get your colleagues and competitors to the table. Help us get your customers to the table too, just to be blunt, the more the merrier here. If you're doing something right and your customer's not asking about it, let us help you get your customer to ask about it. Gives you a bit of an edge, makes you look good, gets us some of the leverage we're looking for, particularly in US food service, for example. Um, I'm just going to close with a, you know, a, a beautiful picture of an octopus and say uh, thank you to all our partners and supporters in the room. Um, become a T75 champion. Many of you are already. Uh, sponsor T75. There's details on the table right in front of you, paperwork about what that entails, uh, what the benefits are. Uh, I hope you found the session useful. I will close on a comment I always make. This is us working with industry. Those of you who have been in this room for many years know that we listen very carefully and adjust what we do to try and reflect best practice, to reflect lessons learned. If you have concerns or questions about what you've heard, do not sit on your hands. Do not walk out if you're going, what a load of crap, I'm, I don't understand any of that. Come to me or come to one of the SR leads that have been waving their hands at various times and ask your questions and share your wisdom. And that way we'll, we'll, we'll get to T75. So thank you very much. And somewhere, uh, hey, let me switch the mic off now. Ah, yeah, question. Sorry, I was, I was, I was heading for the bar. <coughs> this is just tea, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Sir. And can you just name and name rank serial number and then question? That'd be great. Um, I wonder, it seems that you, you worry about the fact that uh, carbs and shellfish is not covered. But I see it as, uh, I see them as a low risk species in the sense that they are mostly herbivores. We talk about uh, Asian carbs and, and uh, households or oysters. They have been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, they, are, they are not without a problem in addition to diseases, but they manage to be relatively sustainable, I think. And so, is there another way of qualifying the objectives, targeting the uh, carnivores and omnivorous species? not feel negative about the fact that carbs and shellfish are not covered, they might not need uh, much uh, certification or uh, projects at this stage. Uh, yes, I think you're right. I mean, I, that was certainly part of the thinking. We looked at every sector worldwide and said, 
Can we reach it? If the answer was yes, we put it into T75. If the answer was no, then we said, do we really need to? Is it, is it got a lot of problems that we need to fix? If yes, then let's stretch and try and get new partners involved, and that's where some of the snapper grouper commitments came from, for example. Uh, with carp, I'm not going to assume there are no environmental issues. It's true they've been farmed for 100 years. It is also true that in the 10 years I've been watching the sector, they've added 20 million tons of production in China in major production forms that did not exist before. I still think they're fine. I'm not saying they're not. But I, I do think there's, there's going to need to be an attempt to look at those sources just to verify what you've said is, is correct. For shellfish, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, a lot of the mussel farming is spectacularly good for the environment. It's not just doesn't do harm. It's spectacularly good for climate change and, and so on, and water filtering and so on. So yeah, there is certainly an element that, that it's not a failing that there's 65 million tons of carp and shellfish that aren't part of the initiative. That's actually part of the good story. The certification and ratings report that is out now, uh, Seafood Watch has rated um, seaweeds and seaweed production generally green, uh, reflecting that. And I'm going to guess 20, 20 million tons of production, something around that level. 13% of that green is seaweed on the fly. Yeah. So there's a lot of seaweed that's already green rated. Um, we are keen to get after shellfish and carp uh, to verify what you've, what you've just said. Juan Manuel, no, oh, this is going to be a trick question, man. It's going to be always hard. Do I consider? It's not a fishery per se, no. Um, but I think it's uh, part of the farming aquaculture matrix that exists on a lot of coastlines. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, you know, it's not my field, so I would defer to experts like folks at Seafood Watch who have done the ratings. Yeah, oh, another trick question coming. Uh oh. <laughs> Uh, what question? <laughs> oh, we do. So there was a slide in there where I referenced the sector reports, and that attempts to break it down. For each sector, we break down exactly what's going on, which fisheries. I mean, it, it, if you look at the sector reports and then you look at what's on the SFP website, there's a landing page for each SR supply chain roundtable. So those supply chain roundtable landing pages also include a list of the target fisheries that we're trying to get into FIPS, the fisheries that are already in FIPS, uh, the, 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 the industry players we're trying to recruit to get after more FIPS. Uh, I just, I mean, I'm open to any ideas on how to do a better job to present that without drowning people in detail, but the detail is there. Yeah. Uh, on your food service comment about yeah. the Service landscape, you think is important? Is it just the people that get the seafood there? Is it the restaurants, like the medium, the larger chain restaurants, or, or the chefs themselves, or, or all? So for me, I mean, I think I think they're all important. But for us, for the for in, in terms of impacting change, I'm going to I'm going to focus on a few large buyers that, if they were to make a commitment and translate it in the same way retailers have done through their suppliers, we'd be able to get a lot of leverage built very quickly. I'm also going to target it on the two or three species where I need more leverage. I'm not going to go talk to any food service player about whitefish because I already got the biggest player in the table, and that's McDonald's. So I want to go after snapper grouper. I want to go after squid, octopus, big menu items, fresh frozen tuna, big menu items. Those are the four main categories where we're trying to go after food service. What's interesting to me is how specific some of that is in different parts of the world. I mean. I don't know what percentage of snapper coming into the U.S. gets eaten in the southeast, but I'm going to guess it's the, the majority of it. The um, majority of blue swimming crab is still eaten in the, mid, in the middle. I don't know what you call those states in your country, but north of the Carolinas and somewhere south of New York. Um, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm not from these parts. Uh, Mid-Atlantic, yeah. Uh, so, but Mid-Atlantic to me means somewhere between my country and your country, but then never mind. It's like your NFL, you know, world champions and world series for baseball. It's like, you know, great. You, know, you think about how that makes the rest of the world feel. Um, sorry, I've got the bully pulpit. I can say what the hell I want. It's huge. Oh, more trick questions. Oh, no. <laughs> I just want to know more about what is going on with Palma Star. Is it yeah. good news that's happening right now? Well, I'm going to ask these guys to, to answer that, actually, because I think there's a ton of good news there. Yeah. Well, 
they got a proposition statement to their delegation which is being brought to South Pacific Directors. Uh, it is formed by Chilean, Chilean producers and processors, uh, Peruvian, Ecuadorian, and now Mexico joint. Uh, they met again in December 2018. There was a second position statement. It was presented to that and all it was read in the commission meeting. Karamazov is an observer uh, of the South Pacific Arab Mall. Um, and they have been uh, recognized. They are, they are there, they are pushing, they are advocating, and they are getting great results in bringing attention to Swedish is China joining or just responding to? Well, China is not joining. It's about the cost of the states. Uh, it's uh, integrating all the, well, we, we wish to get all the cost of the states there. Uh, but yeah, trying to, at the end of the day, in Eastern, uh, in the high seas, you don't have the level of regulation that you have. producers and processors in the jurisdiction of waters are trying to do is to equal what they are doing in coastal waters uh, in high seas. And lastly, is it going to replace country-specific fishery improvement projects, or, or is it if something that's outside of the, the improvement project? Uh, if that's a good question. It's not replacing. Bringing the impact work to the next level. The problem, well, the one challenge of fit sometimes is to get an impact at the RFMO level. Even if you are a national fit, you might get an impact at the national level. It is challenging to get to the RFMO, the RFMO level. What Karmasuri is doing is to aggregate it, to aggregate the key players to upscale that impact at the regional level. Go on then. Um, so one thing that's always struck me about squid is the fact that we bring it into this country and we fry the hell out of it. <laughs> when you go to Asia, there's all these different ways to eat squid. And I, I wonder if that's not part of what needs to happen. I'm not saying you guys can do that, but we need to introduce it as a different way. There are different ways of eating it. Maybe that helps people care about it more than just, you know, it's just totally fried and dip it in the white sauce and eat it. Like, have you ever thought about stuff like that or do you think that's necessary? Um, I've been, it's not what I do, just to be clear. I mean, what I'm trying to do is anyone who's buying fish for whatever purpose, I want them at the table to help drive improvement. I mean, when we look at tuna, we're working with the guys who are buying the offcuts to make animal feed. Uh, we have some of the folks here doing that, uh, as well as the folks doing the fresh frozen, very high end into the sushi, the sushi market. Um, what I have been impressed by uh, has been how Improvements in fish handling and quality that have been part of FIPS have generated benefits for the fishermen taking part. That's not needed to drive improvement, but it's always good news, in my view. It's always a good thing to try and do. It's not, you know, I'm not saying it has to be part of every supply chain. It's hard to do in many cases. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, with squid, you know, I, I always hold up the example uh, in terms of what I, I always make a joke about that and say, you know, once the fish is dead, it really doesn't care what happens to it. You know, you can go into fish meal, pet food, human consumption, doesn't matter. The question is how many fish did you kill in the fishery? Um, we had a, a great example in Chile many years ago. Chilean Jack Mackerel was predominantly a fish meal fishery when it was inside Chilean waters. It was going to salmon production. I, I'm always going to pick on people who are using their cell phones just as I make a comment relevant to them. This time I just don't. No, it's, it's unfair to do that. Yes, it's you. So Chilean Jack Mackerel it was, a, it was a fish meal fishery that was pretty well managed. And then the fish moved out of Chilean waters, went into the high seas, and the fishery fell apart. The product it was being frozen at sea and shipped to Africa for food, which was a great outcome for human nutrition but it had zip to do with sustainability of the fishery. So I think, you know, if, if, however, that would translate into greater earnings in the fishery and that was directly related to sustainability, then, yeah, you know, there's a payoff. Yeah. 
Any other questions? I say hesitating. There's a lot of hard people with hard questions in the audience. They're all being very polite now. That's like part of the let Jim get to the bar initiative. I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Sean, back to you, I think. Uh, we're wrapping up in a few minutes, right? So I just wanted to let people uh, ask questions, talk among themselves. I am not kidding when I say that, you know, if you want to understand what's happening in the fresh frozen tuna market, you talk to Robert, you talk to Tom. I, I can't tell you what these guys don't know. Talk to Tom, Tom Kraft, Tom Pickerel. You know, we got we got people around who can really talk to you about that. Um, you know, and that's true for every single one of these sectors. So if you do have questions and you want to know who the right people are, just ask someone from SFP uh, and we'll point you at the right people. And with that, I'd like to thank you all, and I look forward to your further feedback and abuse later. Thanks, Sarge. So